um, the book Deep Fitness um, resulted from Andre and his he's he's simply the 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 best fitness coach I've ever encountered in my life. And his work and my work met each other. And there was this period where we learned from each other. Um, Andre took a couple of my workshops in the facilitators training, and I was coming in once or twice a week to train with him. And what happened was our, um, our two sort of passions complemented each other and created in effect a third entity which we call mindful strength training to failure uh, which is what deep fitness is about and it does two things um the book really gives a new science-backed understanding of fitness and how to achieve it and how it benefits your life um i mean we're inundated with with messages about why why exercise is good for you but this the book really looks at the specifics of that in a lot of detail the other thing that the book does is it presents training principles and a workout that you can do in half an hour once a week and get stronger and stronger um and the book the book offers it's got illustrations of practices you can do if you have access to a local gym and, and use their machines, or if you're at home and have a resistance band, there's, there are even more practices in the book that you can do by yourself. Um, I'm going to talk about the first um, of those two things the book does, the, the understanding that it presents of fitness and how to achieve it. Um, and Andre is going to present the principles and talk a bit about the workout. Um, just to give a to give a context, our understanding of fitness was largely shaped by a movement in the late 1960s that was initiated by a book called Aerobics, and the word aerobics didn't exist until this book came out. It was written by um, Kenneth Cooper, who was this, I mean, he was considered the fitness expert in America. Um, and there are four claims that he made in the book that we have internalized about fitness. And each one of them has been disproven, but they still have this tenacious hold on us. So. The claims are like number one, the main purpose and benefit of exercise is to strengthen the heart and lungs. False. The most important exercise you can do is aerobic exercise. False. Staying fit requires a major time commitment. And this is like national guidelines say you need to spend two and a half hours a week of of exercise that's false and the more exercise you do the better also false so i'd like to look at each of those assumptions in the light of the past 50 years um of of insight that science has brought to them and a lot of the findings have come in the last 10 to 15 years so the main purpose of and benefit of exercise is to strengthen the heart and lungs. Um, they did an interesting experiment with cyclists who were pedaling with one leg. So they were they they wanted to find out how much their aerobic fitness improved just with the one leg. And so they trained for four weeks, and indeed, their aerobic fitness improved by 23%, I think it was, over those four weeks. But they tested the other leg as well. 
And the difference between the beginning of those four weeks and the end of the training was insignificant. So the aerobic fitness of the untrained leg hadn't changed despite, you know, riding this bike uh, three to four times a week for four weeks. So there had been adaptations in the body, but the adaptations had happened in the muscle primarily. So there, there, it's not that there weren't any adaptations in the heart and the lungs, but they were minimal compared to the adaptations that actually happened in the legs and the muscle of the legs. Second, second claim that Kenneth Cooper made is that the most important exercise is aerobic exercise. Well, if the purpose of exercise were to strengthen the heart and the lungs, um, that would stand, but the adaptations happen in the muscles. Um, and it's been a long journey of, of researchers to track down what changes take place in the body when we exercise. For a long time, they looked for what they called the X factor. Um, the X factor you know, it, it's this unknown thing that happens in the body when we exercise that affects everything in the body. And what they found, this was in the early 2000s, is that muscle hasn't just one primary function, it has two. So the first primary function is to move us around. The second primary function is that muscle is in effect like a hormone factory. So when muscle works, it generates what are, what are now known as myokines, which are messenger molecules that go through the whole of the body and affect every tissue, every organ in the body. There are over 600 different myokines that have been identified. And the stronger a muscle is, and the more um, intensely it works, the more myokines are generated. And so that global effect of exercise on the body is largely due to the myokines that are being produced. And, and what do myokines affect? They affect bone mineral density. They affect mental acuity. They, they help keep diabetes at bay. They strengthen your immune system. I mean, it goes on and on and on. The, the effect that myokines have on the body. So that, um, that speaks to a condition um, that was only named um, a couple of decades ago called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is technically the wasting of muscle as we age. And there's not an inevitability to that, but we make it almost inevitable by the way we live. Um, we sit in chairs, we're carried around by, by cars, we're carried up to the next floor by elevators or escalators. I mean, I don't have to go on about that. Or we, have a, we have a sedentary existence. And there are, um, there are basically three muscle types or not muscle types, there are, in, a, in, a, in, in every muscle, there are three different kinds of fibers that help the muscle do work. One fiber is for endurance, and it doesn't tire quickly. It just keeps going, but it, it hasn't a lot of power. The second fiber is sort of an intermediate fiber that tires more quickly than the endurance fibers, but has more power. The third type of muscle, the powerhouse fiber, has, has immense strength and it is the largest muscle um, in the body, the largest muscle fiber in the body. It does very intense work, it tires quickly, but it's there for emergencies. Like if you suddenly have to run or, or wrestle or whatever it might be, they're there. And there's a very strict regimen of recruitment to these muscles. The, 
the endurance muscles keep going until more work is asked of them than they can deliver. Then the intermediate muscles take over the intermediate fibers until they fatigue and only then do the powerhouse muscles come online. So if, I mean, you, what this means is you can walk five miles a day, every day, and sarcopenia, the wasting of muscles, will be taking place and your ability to create myokines is diminishing because walking does not engage the powerhouse muscles, the largest muscle mass in your body, and they start to atrophy. So, so intense strengthening muscles, uh, intense strengthening exercise is the most direct counteraction to sarcopenia this wasting of muscles. And sarcopenia, there are many medical professionals who will say the true epidemic in, in our health, in, in, in our modern civilizations is sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is associated with every major chronic disease. It's associated with diabetes and Alzheimer's and, osteoporosis and heart disease and on and on. All of those conditions are associated with sarcopenia. Um, you know, so there are doctors who say that the, the true epidemic we face is one of wasting muscles. The third of these claims that Kenneth Cooper put forward, and, and just to say, Kenneth Cooper was a true scientist. He, he looked at the evidence and he has reversed his stand on his original positions. But it's like the Titanic has sailed and there's no turning it around. He said, he said, you know, I feel badly having started this, but, but you know, the amount of publicity his retraction gained um, was is utterly dwarfed by by the 30 million copies of his books that were sold and, and the way the, the message of those books seeped into our culture. So staying fit requires a major time commitment is, is what he was contending. And there is a way of working out and it's been tested over and over where you are working muscles slowly until they fail and what I mean by that is you're you may be you know pushing against a resistance and you just go slowly but there will come a time at which you, the muscles won't push anymore and then you just try to hold it where it is and it, the muscles won't even hold it and and they give up when a muscle is taken to momentary failure your body, the whole of your body, gets the message that the environment is presenting challenges that you're not able to meet. And it rallies its resources to strengthen that muscle. So a process of remodeling begins. And that remodeling takes 72 hours. So if you go back and exercise the next day intensely, um, you know, or the, the day after that intensely, you will be disrupting that modeling process that is trying to make the muscle stronger. So you need at least three days of, between intense workouts. And that means that the most you can do is two workouts a week, um, unless, unless you're very weak, in which case um, you can't work the muscles as intensely so they don't take as long to recover. But even one workout, one half hour workout a week will facilitate your muscles getting stronger and stronger and stronger, which isn't to say you spend the rest of the week lying around on your couch drinking beer. I mean, the mus the, the body needs to move. It, 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 it enjoys riding a bike and walking and all of that is healthy and necessary. But in terms of this, this epidemic that 
that is associated with all the chronic diseases of our modern civilization, the most direct counteraction to sarcopenia is to strengthen the body. And you can do that with just half an hour once a week. Um, the last point that Kenneth Cooper put forth is the more exercise you do, the better. And um, he, he sort of um, had a second look at that when his good friend James Fix died of a heart attack at the age of 52. James Fix wrote the book on running. He was like the guru of running. And all the metrics that Dr. Cooper was going by said he should have been like one of the healthiest people on earth. Uh, you know, he was running an average of 60 miles a week. But you can increase your aerobic fitness at the cost of your health. And more and more um, cases like that were coming in that Cooper looked at. Um, I think he cataloged over a hundred cases of elite athletes um, either dying or coming down with serious illnesses, which totally um, counteracted his original premise. So he adapted his premise, but um, we haven't caught up. You know, that's part of what deep fitness is about, is how to how to um, renew our understanding of the body and its fitness and, and how that fitness promotes your health in, in, every, in every way. I mean, every way, you know, in, 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 in a mental way, the, your, your mental capacity, your physical vitality, your posture. I mean, that, you know, that posture that, that we tend to, to grow into as we age, it's, it's, it's the muscles are unable to support the body. And as they strengthen, your posture changes. Um, there are so many benefits um, to strong muscles. And I can't think of one disadvantage to strong muscles. The only other thing I'd like to say is that in in the course of my week, I am more alive doing this workout than at any other time of my week. And that aliveness, it's something I look forward to every single time. Um, it feeds my soul. And, and because the workout's very slow, and Andre will speak to this, because it's very slow, you're able to be completely present to what is happening. And we are, we are trained by our culture in a top-down approach, whereby when, you know, when, you're, when you're exercising, your head knows what the body should do. And it's, it's, like, it's like somebody riding a donkey, beating the donkey to go harder, to go faster. And, and deep fitness, renews that relationship, brings you back to the body and allows the body to find joy and, and to, you know, to bring you out of that divided state where you're living in your head, telling your body what to do. It allows the whole of your being to come into unity in the process of experiencing it come to failure. And in our culture, we failure has a has a very bad reputation. Um, when I go to failure in this workout, I it is one of the deepest encounters with myself that I could have, and it's new every time, and it's a it's an experience. I, you know, I've said. And it's it's hard to explain this, but but every every workout is a spiritual practice for me, and that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Um, so Andre, I'll pass it over to you. 
there. <clears throat> Thank you, Philip. Um, yes. Uh, so first, before I start, you know, talking about the technicality of this workout, again, I like to mention that, uh, you know, I've been thinking about doing this project, writing a book about this training for a while, and somehow one day I had this great, you know, crazy idea, <clears throat> asking Philip if you want to do it with me, and he said yes. And now we have, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best books on this subject there are. Um, so thank you, Philip, and thank you, Alison. You guys are just, you know, without you, the book would never be of such a high quality. Um, you know, before I talk, talk about the, uh, the actual, we call them guiding principles, because if you understand them, they kind of guide your cues, your workout, and your training come from those principles. I just want to mention, you know, a couple of things. One, when we say, it only takes 30 minutes and you get stronger. Well, <clears throat> it's not just the theory. We've actually been doing it with clients for years and we record everything. We record every workout, the machine, the settings, the time under tension, the weights. And those clients who follow those guiding principles, using the right muscles, moving slowly, mindfully, bringing those muscles to failure, all of them, without exception, get stronger from week to week, week to week, week to week, even if they're only working out 30 minutes a week. So there is science behind it, but also enough of empirical observations we've accumulated over the years, we can say with, with confidence, it works. Um, the guiding principles, I, you know, when first I opened element training around eight years ago, you sort of don't know what you're getting yourself into. I, I used to do geophysics before, I never been a fitness professional, even though you know I was kind of an athlete when I was younger, but never had any formal training in this area. I just fell in love with this form of strength training, and to me it was the most rational uh, way to do it. And also the fact that it doesn't take as much time is a huge benefit. You know, being busy professional that was uh, was you know was a uh, very appealing to me, and. You know, when opening your own training, they kind of expect that everybody you just tell them how it works and they'll just do it. And then, you know, you see people coming from different demographics, different abilities, mental, neurological, physiological, you know, different ages and so on and so forth. And then realize it's not as simple as it looks. And over the years, observing people, working with people, I realized if we can synthesize this training around this three guiding principles. And there is the fourth one, which is the mindfulness, which Philip already mentioned. But you know, as far as the technique goes, those are the three main ones. And then once I understood how to explain this training to our clients from those three principles, those people who understood follow those principles, everybody got excellent results. Everybody was very satisfied with their progress and results. And so Let's talk about those principles. Now, before I, I mention them again, a little bit point about the mindfulness because it's another principle, which as Philip said, that this is how he feels alive. This is you know, how he connects with his core. Uh, and that's a you know, kind of spiritual experience for him. Well, that's somebody who been you know, doing his core practice for over 40 years. <laughs> for average person, um, there is faster way, you might not get as a spiritual of experience, but there's a faster way to kind of find, start finding joy in, in your practice. And it's simply what you try to do, and Philip did it to me, and I remember he was cueing me and my muscles are failing and shaking, but like I had a smile on my face because part of me did, didn't want this to end, even though, you know, my muscles were trembling and is that the cueing is prioritize the experience you know once you understand the technicality of the exercise of all the movements you know what you're doing from there on just simply feel everything feel from second to second every second will 
inform you of something new, something different, and kind of be that self-explorer of those sensations. Just feel it. Focus on the feeling and the experience. And the more you tune in to those experiences without any agenda, any you know, expectations, the more you will embody yourself and kind of bypass that vigilant part of you and you will reconnect with something that it just feels amazing. Basically, you taking a break from yourself you're taking a break from that you know supervisor of you that that ego that you know keeping you safe you know against the world so the difference is when i do that kind of workout i finish my workout after 30 minutes i sit down i want to repeat it again because it felt so good if i don't do with using those mindfulness cues i still do my workout but then I don't feel like doing this workout for another few days. You know, that's the difference. It just feels great if you learn how to prioritize the experience versus, as Philip, you know, uh, discussed, you know, doing it from completely from the head. Um, so usually when we work with clients, we first focus on just the technicality part of it. But once we understand the training, then, you know, those clients who are open to this mindfulness practice, then we, you know, I start using those mindfulness cues and help them to sort of start finding the joy of approaching when you approach muscle failure. Now, the other three principles. So that I guess that if the mindfulness is first one, the second one would be what we call muscle first, movement second. One of the common mistakes, if you just go to a gym and you observe people lifting weights, one of the most common mistakes, if you know what you're looking at, you will see that people prioritize the movement over engaging the, the right muscles they're trying to target. So it's all about getting the handle, let's say if you're using a machine, a pull down exercise from point A to point B and just doing this. Um, and it was challenging for us to you know, teach people how to engage the right muscles and so on. And you know, sometimes I would ask client on a rowing machine, feel it in the lats and they would turn to me and say, I don't know where the lats are. And it was kind of, you know, I can only repeat my cues so many times until we get tired. So let's, let's go do something else. But then I observed generally younger people in their 20s, 30s don't have that issue. It's only like as we get older, clients beginning to, you know, having a hard time feeling certain body parts. And again, didn't really know how to help them so much outside of just repeating myself over and over and over. And it wasn't really helping until I, mean, I came across this book again, came from Philip's workshop where he mentioned this uh, two finger monkey experiment in relation to his work. And I listened to that experiment and said, this is what I'm seeing in, in your mind training. And then of course I asked him which book he, you know, where he got it from, I read the book and Philip asked him not to be too technical. So I'm gonna briefly mention, they asked monkey to move middle finger, sorry, and index finger, and then the founder's assertion neurological brain map turn on. Ask monkey to move middle finger, another neurological brain map turn on. Essentially, monkey had one individual map moving this finger, one individual map in the brain moving this finger. They call them topographical brain maps. If two body parts are close to each other, these neurological brain maps typically will neighbor each other as well. So what they did in the experiment with those monkeys, they tied this to finger for a few months. So monkey can only do this, only can move two fingers at the same time. And after a few months, when they look at the brain, what they discovered that those individual maps were gone and monkey developed one large map instead. So even if you disconnect these two fingers, monkey was not able to move them separately, only together. Why? There was no map in the brain, you know, signal that, activating those motor units for this movement, only for this. So the key here is with this principle to realize it all starts with the brain. The brain plastic at every age, and it will adapt to your habitual lifestyle, the way you move, the way you activate certain muscles, not activate others. And some parts in the brain is gonna get stronger, those ones that you master all the time, but other parts that you don't master, you don't use them, they're gonna atrophy. So the atrophy happens first neurologically on the, on the brain level. And that was the harm of the last, okay, the reason people didn't feel those last and right muscles, why? Because 
it's not that necessarily muscles were weak, they were, but mainly because there was no signal coming from the brain. So they can even feel those muscles. If you cannot send a signal to those muscles, how can you expect to feel those muscles? So then we know we change the cues, which is where we started to teach people how to just focus on feeling those muscles as clearly as they can, even if it's very subtle. There is this principle in brain plasticity is where we pay close attention to a task. We activate certain part in the brain which will start produce this neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. When you have high level of that neurotransmitter, the brain becomes soft and plastic. It will create, facilitate the new memory connections fairly fast, right? Patterns in the brain. And, you know, children, for example, they produce acetylcholine all the time. They don't have to pay attention. They just absorb and the brain remembers. As the brain matures, that system shuts off, but we can still reactivate it by, paying close attention to a task. And they use this principle, the stroke patients, you know, ask somebody to pick up a pencil, they can't. They ask somebody to focus, focus, focus. The more somebody focuses, the faster they learn how to, to do this. And so this is where this principle originated from. That realization is when you do the exercise, make sure you feel the right muscle. And if you cannot feel them, just do static call. Try to feel them as clearly as you can, even if it's very subtle. The more you're paying attention to that muscle, the more acetylcholine the brain will produce, the faster you're going to get stronger because now you're going to strengthen those neurological brain maps that's kind of been atrophying over these years. And the, the stronger they get, the bigger they get, the more motor units they will activate and engage. And hence, you will be, gener will be able to generate more force and more strength. So principle is that. If you don't feel the muscle, you're not working the muscle. So this is why that we know there are some exercises that we discuss in the book or at the gym. Uh, you have to have very clear intention and understanding which muscles you're trying to work and make sure you feel those muscles. Okay, so that's the second principle. Another one, slow mindful movement. The goal here is not to do, you know, 20 repetitions or to lift 500 pounds. The goal is simple. What you're trying to do, you're trying to turn this switch on for adaptation, right? You're not trying to demonstrate strength. You know, a power lifter on the stage lifting the barbell from point A to point B is trying to demonstrate strength, which is perfect. If that's your goal, you know, go get better at that. But our goal here is to build strength. So it's a very different objective. Then the question is, what's then, you know, efficient, effective, safe way to turn that light switch on, build strength? Well, moving slowly and mindfully, feeling the right muscles. Remember those princi first principle, neural connection. You're going to strengthen those faster as the brain will produce more acetylcholine when you pay attention. And allow us, as Philip discussed about uh, different muscle fiber types, it's called sequential muscle fiber recruitment. Allow your body to tap, use some of the slow twitch fiber, endurance fibers. Once they're fatigued, the brain's going to start using the higher order fibers, intermediate twitch. Once they are out, then the brain's gonna tap into those fast switch powerhouse fibers. How do we know when we're into those power fast switch fibers is you're gonna feel certain agitation. And when you feel agitated, that's kind of the part of this training. Don't stop, this is where the training begins. Because that's when you signal your body, this is an emergency and the body will start producing adrenaline and that adrenaline is gonna make you agitated so you can be present and deal with this emergency right now. You won't think about anything else, right? So this is your objective. Moving slowly, mindfully, sequentially go through these types of fiber, these types of fibers, you will feel it. And then once you feel that kind of agitation, you start using those fast switch fibers. Fast switch fibers only last maybe a minute, but they need several days to recover. Once you exhausted the fast switch fibers, the switch is being turned on. You know your body will recognize it as an emergency and will respond fast by activating some of those dormant fast switch fibers that's been atrophying, sitting there and not doing much for all these years. So that's essentially what you're trying to do. That's how we build strength. We're moving slowly, using the right muscle, and then get all the way until we activate the fast switch fibers. And the last principle is you know, going to muscle failure. This is essentially what this training is all about. 
as far as you know i can sort and many of us who you know offering this style of training professionally we agree that the majority of the benefits happen in this last 15 30 seconds everything you do prior to that is to get you to that zone when you kind of you know enter that deep forest and you don't know what's going to happen and you just bravely go there and you're just doing your best and then you know you stop when you can't like what i mean is let's say you're doing a push-up from the floor at some point you won't be able to push yourself away you just you'll get stuck yeah so that's what we call point of muscle failure you keep in a perfect form and you keep moving the resistance and you feel how the muscles getting tired more tired tired to the point where they get so exhausted where you recruited all the available resources that you are unable to continue while keeping a good form this is what simply we call point of momentary muscle failure or muscle failure and because we activate adrenaline there's the adaptations happen on, on epigenetic on dna level on cellular level such that you simply won't tap into the same response in the body unless you go into that level of intensity uh and another reason to go to failure simply that will ensure you're going to get stronger germans call this principle overload theory which they come up with this principle over 100 years ago around 100 years ago and the theory stated that essentially the only way to make muscles stronger is to train progressively so asking muscle to do more work than the previous time again more work than the previous time then the muscle will respond adapt and become stronger if the muscle doing the same amount of work it can handle it's not much of a stimulus so what happens when you go to failure let's say you're doing a wall sit it takes you two minutes to reach failure today you know five four five seven days from now doing another wall sit might take you two minutes 15 seconds because your capacity expanded and you're going to go to failure again so when you go to failure essentially you're taking your muscles to its current existing capacity not of a capacity of one week ago, of capacity of today. And if you maintain the right balance between these principles and recovery and nutrition, your muscles are going to get stronger. And then each time when you go to failure, you will progressively overload the muscle more than last time, more than last. That's why you get stronger, stronger, and stronger. So essentially, this is what this training is about. If you want to find joy in it rather than suffering, bring mindfulness into it prioritize the muscle over the movement because very often some exercises you want you will bypass the muscles you need to target and strengthen something else instead and that's why it might lead to more you know imbalances in your body down the road move slowly and mindfully you're not here to demonstrate strength here to build strength bring your muscle to muscle failure those are the principles and when you understand those principles and you apply them in your training you know take your time let those principles settle in why they matter, why they're important. Because if you understand them and you respect them and you follow them, I can guarantee you, you'll be very satisfied with your progress and how fast you get stronger. I should mention one more, one more thing as well. I was thinking the other day um, is that, you know, when people go into this workout, and asking us question, how long should I go? Or how many repetitions? Those kind of questions. What should I record? The key is this. Forget about all that. Just prioritize this principle. Use the right muscle. Make those muscles fail. Rest a few days and repeat. As long as you're doing it, it doesn't matter which order you do the exercises. As long as you're doing that, your body is going to get stronger because that's your goal. Once you go to muscle failure, you exhausted all the available fast switch muscle fibers, the body will respond and get stronger. So that's your objective. It's not about how long you're going to go. It's not about how many repetitions you're going to do. It's about feeling the right muscles and bringing them to failure. That's your objective. And then you move and then you can you know, mix it up. Routine, exercises, order. That's really what it's all about. So this is what I have to say. I would just like to add, um, you know, that theory that you'll get stronger and stronger. I'm coming up to my 69th birthday, remarkably enough, and I'm still, I'm getting stronger. 
um, and stronger. And I, you know, I can, I can see it in the, the times I'm recording and the fact that I'm needing to, to increase the weights as I go. And that's, you know, that's a bit of a miracle to me. That's a godsend. Um, it's just so opposite to, to what one is led to expect. Um, I'd also like to say that to get the most from the workout, um, I'd invite you to consider booking a session with Andre, a virtual session. Um, I've just never encountered anyone who can coach someone through these practices with the specificity and support that Andre brings 